Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I'm glad to be invited here and then share some of our very recent work on uh, biophysical attributes on cell therapy products. So this is actually, a lot of it is actually not yet published. So it, it is good and bad. It's not fully validated, but also kind of exciting. But here, I'm actually representing a very large group of researchers that I'm working with, and some of them is actually from Singapore. So in Singapore, MIT has a very special relationship with them. So we run a very big uh, program called Smart Camp. It's a critical attribute for personalized medicine, meaning basically a CQA for sarin gene therapy. And it involves uh, many universities of MIT and Singapore hospitals and, and very large teams of researchers, uh, all focusing on one mission, which we believe a critical bottleneck of the current industry, which is that you know, we all uh, are excited about this possibility of harvesting a patient cell and developing it, engineer them, and grow them, and inject back into the patient to do something that previously impossible to do. But right now, this entire process is not yet controlled or not yet monitored. So when we do this uh, product, we don't have any good mechanism to validate the quality of the cells that we are injecting or using to achieve the uh, therapeutic purposes. And this is, uh, you know, is a, a lot, um, oftentimes described as a critical quality attribute. So when you uh, deliver these cells, therapeutic cells, to the patient, how do we know that these cells are of the appropriate quality or appropriate identity even? And not only that, when you actually manufacture these cells, you know, processing them, how do you monitor and, and understand that these processes of expanding these cells are actually going okay. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong in these processes. So, of course, I'm a, just another electrical engineer and I'm not really knowledgeable in this entire space. I'm just borrowing a lot of the teachings of my colleagues. But then the fact of the matter is that this is our recent collaborative result. And I will introduce the team at the end of the talk that current CAR-T products manufactured, not grown by graduate student or undergraduate student, these are all purchased CAR-T product. We paid a lot of money to get uh, 15 different cell groups from 15 different donors. And we look at the effectiveness of these products using killing assay, and you can do all these other assays, like a fax and other, no matter what you do, you will realize that these are not a uniform product. These are very, very variable. And some of them are really good. Some of them are really poor. And there is no way currently to tell which one's gonna be which. And this is a really big problem. Imagine that you are treating a cancer patient with these products and then you are really basically running a lottery between this product versus that product. That's a huge risk factor. So this is the problem that our MIT team and also our Singapore collaborators are trying to tackle, not just in one way, but in many different ways. So, but then let me take a little analogy here. It, it feels like I'm walking into a grocery store and trying to buy a watermelon for my barbecue party in the summer. I don't know which one is gonna be sweet, which one is gonna be a dud. One thing I know I cannot do is eating them, okay? So we are actually at the same exact situation because these products, the CAR-T and MSCs and IPSC, no matter what kind of cell product you're talking about, they are most likely going to be inherently heterogeneous and they are also very precious and expensive so you don't have so many of them. So you can't really utilize the destructive CQA, like uh, proteomics or genomics or anything that destroys the cell. You can't use it because someone might say, okay, you sample a few of them, and if a few of them are sweet, then everything here is sweet. You know that's not true because some of the watermelons are not going to follow the majority behavior. And uh, 
So this is a problem. So how do we solve this problem? We develop a, what I define as a non-destructive CQA. So one people might say, OK, I'm just going to go with the largest thing. OK, maybe I'm not going to short chain. So that is a cell size. And that's a recent, decent idea. But you know that may not be the perfect idea. Some other people may look at, OK, I, I think the overlaid one is sweeter than the circular one. But what's the basis for that? And then more advanced technology might involve tapping the watermelon, mechanical property. And that might actually give you some inside information about the content of the watermelon. But that still needs to be correlated closely with the actual CQA, the destructive CQA. So and in our team, if you go further, you can even things, do things like smelling the fruit, OK, secretum. Or if you really want to be a techie, just like a typical MIT guys, you can actually do something like electromagnetic signature. And I can tell you that in our, my team, in our team, collaborative team of Singapore and MIT, we are actually looking all of these all together because we think that this is a very big signature challenges of the cell therapy. So today I'm not going to talk about all of these exciting emerging data, just focus on one aspect, which is a mechanical properties of looking at the CAR-T uh, product. So what do I mean by mechanical or biophysical properties? So we want to look at the uh, probe, the T cell, but not by breaking up the cell, not by analyzing them, but by looking at things like shape or size or morphologies and, and other features that doesn't involve breaking and destroying the cell. And that might involve uh, size and, and you know, shape and even something like a distribution of the size. And, and there are a lot of academic papers already coming out because the need for non-destructive non biophysical CQA is so dire. But this is not just another academic idea. We already have uh, emerging machines that are selling on the market that is trying to look at all these features of the size and deformability morphologies and things like that, even impedance. You know? So this is not a crazy idea. And there are certainly a clear need for something like this. And there are certainly a, a clear evidences that this might work. And, and so, so this is our versions of doing a mechanical or biophysical probing of the cell, especially the T cell. So this is the paper we published a while ago. And this is a technology called uh, deterministic uh, lateral displacement. Essentially, is a repeated uh, bumping of the cell into a microstructure. And then based on that interaction, we're going to be figuring out both the size and the mechanical signature of the cell collectively. So uh, our intellect, uh, this is certainly not just us doing it. But our intellectual property is lying in designing these elaborate structures of these bumps so that we can maximize the information that can be extracted out of this repeated bumping of the T cell into these features. So uh, these are the devices that we are using. It's a microfluidic devices. And then I think the, 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 the reason, rationale for going microfluidics is that, first of all, these devices tend to utilize a very small amount of cells. So we can still get some useful information about the populations without blowing up tens of thousands of cells. Typically, we only need about a thousand or less number of cells. And the way we work with this is that we actually bring in, in with a raw cell sample, sometimes even raw blood or unsorted uh, WBC population or even uh, crude T cell. And then this is both a mechanical probing device and also the separation device. So any kind of a small debris will be separated. And then the size-based separation can occur. So larger cells, for whatever reason, these cells are larger. They actually end up into a different location. And then the certain other size cells end up in this location. So what you do is at the end of this device, you actually monitor and look at what happens while the cells are coming in. So 
And this all, entire process is now fully automated. So we actually pushed our technology far beyond the typical maturity level seen by the university project. And then now we have, uh, we actually hire a few engineers to kind of make these uh, devices automated. So, and at the end of this process, you see uh, sampling about thousands of cells quickly and rapidly, and then we have a distribution, which can be a distribution of the size and deformability of individual cell all together. So, now, uh, the other thing I would like to highlight is that this is not just the graduate student running it. Uh, we actually make a box. So this is a box that we assembled in Singapore labs. And uh, this is probably as professional as one can possibly get in university research. So we have uh, automated uh, stages and device loading and unloading. Everything here is fully automated. So we are actually deploying this machine in local hospitals in Singapore, and we actually ask the nurses to operate these devices for the purposes of immune profiling for uh, sepsis patients and other immune challenged patients we see in the ICU. But then that's a, another application. But that actually tells us some confidence to tell you that this kind of system is actually reached a certain technological maturity to be deployed on the manufacturing floor so uh, the loading and unloading is all automated, and then this is generally low-cost material. The device is low-cost. And also, when we get these data set, we actually analyze the data almost automatically. We are actually actively building a machine learning model to extract many different features, not just one, but many different features, and then utilize those features to correlate the downstream quality of these cells that are putting in. So uh, just the very first testing we are doing, so we can simply have a sanity check, you know, when we have a naive T cell versus activated T cell and also dying T cell, we can actually clearly see the difference in terms of size and deformability and then distribution of these cells in, in a given population. So we, we know that this kind of assay can definitely tell you some specific phenotypic characteristics of the cells you are studying. Now, this is just a very first data set we got. And then, uh, going further, we are also starting to deploy this uh, in a bit more specifically uh, related to the application of CAR-T therapy. So, for example, let's say we have a uh, uh, non-transduced naive T cell, and versus uh, we have uh, transduced CAR T, we see a clear difference in distributions of the cell, which means that these transduced cell will have a different size and deformability characteristic. And also, we actually do this thing with kind of a, in the surrogate model of a killing assay, meaning that we add the target cells to the T cell, X, you know, in vitro and then run these cell groups together and then we can clearly see that whether these target cells are interacting with the effector cell or not. And then these kind of information may not give you exactly the binding site or all these molecular biology, but it is going to be very rapid. These kind of assay can take only about 15 minutes or less and also uh, can be definitely correlated with the information that we want to go after. So another demonstration of this device is that uh, this is really tracking the production processes of a CAR T. And then I'm learning that you know, these cells are separated from NUCA packs. And then you are engineered and then cultured ex vivo or, or approximately for about 14 days. And then at the end of the 14 day, it is kind of uh, packed up and sent out to the patient. So these are the very standard CAR-T production processes. And here, we are using this same device as a PAT, essentially. So along these 15 day processes, each time we sample a little bit of cells and see whether the uh, production and expansion 
process is going well. And you can see that for the first few days, day four and day five, you can see a significant expansion and changes in the profile. This reflects the activation and transfection of these T cells, which is often seen in normal processing. So we have a potential to use this kind of device as a PAT device. Uh, and this is possible because we are only requiring thousands of cells, not tens of thousands of cells. And also we can build up a strong correlation between some of the standard assays, such as fax panels. So this is uh, one of our features that we can extract from this distribution and some of the fax uh, data. And then in in, this is just a two example, but we, we can find more examples like that. So this can potentially be uh, used as a surrogate for the more standard facts-based analysis of these cells. Finally, uh, what is really we want to try to do is at the end of the day, the, you can measure the car positive cell per percentage and all, but then ultimate measurement will be a functional one, whether this cell is going to get be able to kill the target cell in vitro as well as in vivo. And we are not there yet in terms of trying any in vivo experiment. That would be just way too far away for us. But at least we can try the killing assay. And then we also found that you know, our uh, DLD assay features, and there are a number of features. We have more than 30, 40 features. And we scan all these different features and select the ones that are highly correlated with the important functional metric, which is a killing efficiency or car positivity and all these things, which requires an extensive effort and money and time to measure for the, with the conventional method, we can actually measure it with the DLD and then with enjoy the strong correlation. This is one example of correlating the uh, cytotoxic car positive cell uh, percentage versus the one of the feature. Actually, this is a model prediction assembling 10 different DLD features. And these are those features uh, uh, correlation values. But the big message here is that even purely based on such a simple biophysical non-destructive assay, we can more or less predict what is the cytotoxic CAR T percentage in these populations. So that's uh, very exciting. And we are still generating more and more correlation between our data set and, and more important functional metrics. So uh, finally, uh, at the beginning of the talk, I, I talked about a watermelon searching problem. And we know that you know, this biophysical and biomechanical way of doing things is exciting because it's generating an exciting result for us now. But that's not the only thing we can do. We are actually testing all these different features, including electromagnetic ones. And so this project that we are, we are running is so exciting because I'm a physicist, and I have all these physical way of handling and measuring the cell. And then my colleagues, and very many of them are uh, actually working hard to correlate these biophysical measurement with the bio biological characteristic or biochemical characteristic by doing all these standard and conventional assay. And you know, I can tell you that those assays are much, much more difficult to do than some of the biophysical assay that we are running. So, but then you can see the vision of this project is that we, there are a number of places where we can deploy these assay especially when you actually select the original cell source or donor, or even identifying the patient who might respond to certain therapy better than the others, or in process as a PAT, okay, where your expansion process is going well or not well. And finally, as a release assay, when you're ready to go, you are encouraged or you know, almost required to do a release assay. And in our uh, biophysical measurement of cells can contribute to many important junctures of the entire cell therapy workflow. So with that, I would like to close my talk. These are the three faces who actually very significantly contributed to this talk's work. And just, I'm just gonna 
just take all the credit. Uh, but not just these three people, there are a number of people, both in Singapore and MIT side, who are working hard to make these very collaborative project possible. So I, I'd like to thank all of them. And I also I'd like to thank our funding support, both from Singapore government and US government, uh, uh, especially through the Nimble uh, projects. Thank you for listening. monitor yes so uh, so this is a very good question so just like the problem of choosing the right watermelon we don't think that one biophysical attributes is going to be able to solve the challenges that we are facing. And even if they do, we won't, won't have enough confidence about the result. So our goal, that's the reason why we have a number of different features. You know, electromagnetic impedance and, and you know, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, you know, bio, biophysical characteristics, and you know, even uh, autofluorescence, optical characteristics, size and shape and all these things. So our vision is that we need to combine all these measurements all together. And some of them is going to be repetitive. Some of them will be overlapping a lot, but that's okay. That's gonna only give us more confidence about the result. So uh, ultimately, uh, our uh, first deliverable as a project team is just a CQA or, or, or sets of CQA to get uh, highest confidence about the quality of the given product that we are dealing with, either CAR-T or mesenchymal stem cell and others. Yeah. Let me just read the next one so the online audience can hear it as well. Can we reverse the approach and manipulate those biophysical attributes to induce desired biological phenotypes? Okay, so this is a very interesting question. Um, I think it can, uh, although it is very widely open areas of research, even from the academic uh, standpoint. You know, so is a perturbing the cell mechanically, certainly induce some mechanical signaling and cues, and that can indeed induce some phenotypic changes. And you know, that would be very exciting and important areas of research. Uh, we are not yet putting that as a highest priority in our team yet, but that would be a great academic project. I would personally love to engage in that kind of project after we deliver the CQA. Okay, great. One more question. Um, what additional measurements could you add? To okay, so I didn't have a, maybe I can go back to so uh, I didn't have a chance to discuss all the exciting work that is coming out from Singapore and MIT altogether. There are some of the uh, promising ones that I would like to point out. So more recently, we see that autofluorescent measurement from the cell seems to be very interestingly correlated with the metabolism of the cell. And that can tell you a lot about cell phenotype. And these autofluorescence can also doesn't require any labeling or anything. It's just a very quick measurement, an optical measurement. So we are very uh, gung-ho about this part, the optical autofluorescence tracking of cells. Uh, my personal favorite is the magnetic signaturing, so magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So we think that this is a way to quantify the intracellular ion content and we are coming out of, with a few new papers recently, and that can tell you a lot about cellular senescence and other phenotypic characteristics. I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but that is also very exciting and very novel. And also, there are other things, such as impedance. Impedance is a very easy and rapid measurement, so the, the, the benefit of the, doing the impedance is that it can be operated in a very high throughput, 
and maybe even coupled with the sorting. So, and then the other mission that we are trying to pursue with the CQA is that once we build the CQA, then the next job for us is actually sorting based on the CQA. So that's the kind of a next phase of our project. So there are a lot of things that I am hoping to communicate with you. If you are interested, reach out to us and then we would have you know, discussions about all these things we do in our team. So the last question, have you tried to correlate DLT, I'm not sure what that is, but you probably know, with other functional attributes like cell profiler proliferation or IFNG secretion? Yes, good question. Yes, we, we are doing that right now. We are actually seeing a very uh, significant correlation with both of them, so proliferation and secretion. And this kind of correlation is also related to the size and deformability. So uh, which parameter, regardless of the parameter we are looking at, they seem to be correlated with the proliferation and then secretion profile. So we are doing it right now, and then we are also developing a novel way of rapidly screening the cell, single cell-based secretion using the droplet microfluidics, which is the topic that I didn't have a time to talk about. So yes. So great, thanks very much, Chaya Han, for this interesting presentation.